And um, I'm going to play uh, some music at the end a little bit so uh, but we can finish out with some music, but it's the, it, I printed that out. Our, one of our songs of Ascent is the old hymn, as you see when it was written in 1674 to 1748 is when Isaac Watts was alive. So sometime during that time he wrote, we're marching to Zion. Some of us of a certain age will remember that. <laughs> Not everybody, uh, but uh, that is sort of an idea of a song of ascent, which I wanted to uh, close out today with. So um, we're going to get going here. And again, we have much to be thankful for. There are many wonderful things that are going on. Uh, in and around and amongst our church and so forth, but there's also much pain and suffering as we've seen in this world right now, just the face of evil comes on our, uh, the picture of pure evil comes right up on our TV screens for us to see how evil unfolds itself in uh, the situation of war and it's just tragic. It's just tragic that um, this is going on. I don't know why. I certainly can't explain it why. <laughs> but it is part of God's plan. And there are no coincidences for timing or what anything about it. So um, we just need to make sure that we are paying attention and trying to understand how this fits in and what we are to uh, learn about it or learn to do about it. But my goodness, just staggering the evil that is uh, unfolding. And we it is not the first time it's happened. <clears throat> this is exactly what was going on in Aleppo only a few years ago by the same people, by the way. And... Uh, uh, it happened in Kosovo, it happened in Rwanda, it happened in the Sudan, it happened in Grozny, it's happened, and that's recent, relative recent history, in the last 25 or 30 years or so, uh, we've had those same things. We just didn't have the benefit of everybody in the world walks around with one of these. And thankfully, right from the beginning, Elon Musk made sure there was a satellite connection over Ukraine all the time. And people have the internet and the ability to send out pictures. It, it, because we couldn't all have been there. All this was happening before so this is nothing new. And this has been happening since the beginning. This is what evil looks like. And anytime anybody wants to tell you there is no evil force in this world, has no way to cover that up anymore. If you have any idea, eyes to see at all, um, you can see it. So, and that's what we need to be saved from that evil and that terrible thing that happened when sin entered this world, the evil that's in men's hearts and people's hearts. So, okay, let's get started. Um, let's ask the Lord's blessing on us as we gather around his word this morning. Thank you, Lord, for this hymn book that you put in your word, tucked away in and amongst many other songs that express such important emotions that we understand how coming into contact with who you are and what you're doing in this world finds its expression in our thanksgiving, in our gratitude, in our praise, and in our worship. Thank you for this lesson in what kinds of things to do to prepare our hearts to worship. 
and to bring praise to you with clean hands and a pure heart. Help us to be useful to you in our world today as we encounter such terrible evil and the pain and suffering that it brings on so many people. Help us to support every way we can getting your light and your word and your help to those people. Help us to glorify you in our own lives each time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, let's take a look. And I I put a sort of an introduction there about the Psalms of Ascent. Maybe you are not familiar with them, but these are a section of this very long book, the Psalms, 150 of them. There are 15 of them which have been set apart to be called the Songs of Ascent. And these Songs of Ascent, many of them were written by David. So chronologically, they would fit in the time that we are in the scripture in our, in our chronological following. But many, some of them were written, uh, one was written by Solomon, which would be a little later, and one was probably uh, written by Ezra, which would be way later. So uh, these are a collection that have happened over a number of years, but they have been um, put together as a hymn book, so to speak. Uh, which are meant to prepare people for worship. Now, when they were originally written, and David organized this himself, and we'll read about that in 2 Samuel when, when he is king and has established Jerusalem, and, and it's not even, the temple hasn't even been built at that time, but what he's doing is teaching people how to prepare for worship. And the worship times that are prescribed for the Hebrew people, for the Jewish people by God, were the feast days. We talked about those back in uh, Leviticus. Leviticus 23 outlines them. There are seven of them, but they are grouped sort of together. Some of the days are together. And it, there was a mandate by the Lord that three times a year for three of these festivals, everyone was to make a trip to, from wherever they lived in Israel to Jerusalem. And, uh, and it was for at when the temple was built, it was to worship at the temple. But before the temple was built, it was to come into the presence of the Lord. Now, what is the presence of the Lord for Israel? Where was it? Over the mercy seat between the cherubim, the Ark of the Covenant. So it was in the holy place. So, but, but the idea is you come into his presence with singing. And there, there are songs of preparation of your heart and your mind. There are songs of gratitude. There are songs of asking for help. There are all kinds of songs here. I, I don't know how many we can go through very uh, carefully, but there are some that I, I really want to spend a few minutes on. I put that first page there. I kind of put the idea of stair steps <laughs> Because uh, like a pilgrimage, which is what I discussed on that first page there, like a pilgrimage, it is, has a, you're going to a place for a purpose. And that is the reason you're traveling. It's not just wandering or meandering around or, or uh, with no thought or purpose in mind. It is, uh, you, you are to reach the journey and the idea, um, exile is um, living in the world, <laughs> sort of living in the world and we're moving toward our heavenly home and we can look at it from today as well as, as they did back then because they had the same idea. 
the temple, um, the 15 in the middle, there's sort of a chiasm, you begin and end, uh, but there's a focus at each focus in the middle is the uh, presence of the Lord or the temple or the place where the Lord built his house would be the, the middle one. So you have seven going and seven leaving and one focus in the middle there. Uh, if you get it, uh, he's, he's dead now, a long time ago, but James Boyce, uh, excellent writer, excellent uh, pastor. He was a pastor of the 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia, in case any. Now, 10th, I don't, I get first. I even get second, but 10th. <laughs> Uh, but uh, he uh, he did such a good job with uh, the Psalms. I enjoyed reading his thoughts about it. But he calls them discipleship songs. That's why I put that there, because that's sort of how we see ourselves, discipleships. We're disciples, followers. Um, they saw themselves as uh, followers or travelers as well uh, back in in the day, but we we need to come away with the thought in our mind that the one who has redeemed us, that one who loves us, demands everything and praise and gratitude from us because of what he's done. Demands, as the song says, love so amazing, so divine. Demands my soul, my life, and my all. So I'm going to share screen here just briefly. Hopefully we will see this. And uh, this is what I was referring to, that first page. Let's begin with the first one. Uh, <clears throat> this is sort of the picture of where everybody begins on their travel out in the world. <laughs> and that's the way it's designed. It's, these are ordered in a particular order, not when they were written or by whom they were written, but how, what the message of the Psalm itself is. And like some of our praise and worship songs that we have today, there's, you know, they're very short. You don't have a, a, an awful lot of content in it. Now you need to think of these and you can get them, uh, you can uh, look, them, look at them on YouTube. All of these are, have been placed into musical um, choral, kinds of things and you can hear each one of them sung it's very much like the chants and Gregorian chants and so forth that you hear um it's it's not modern music at all but uh you can hear and we need to sort of think of these as hymns and we need to sort of think of these as real people men women and children moving and uh, usually they would travel in large groups together for safety and, and helping each other on the journey and literally travel from way up in the northern portion or way down in the southern portion or way out on the western portion and travel toward Jerusalem as groups to arrive for the feast day. And the first of the feasts uh, that would be celebrated would be Passover. And then the second one would be sometime later, which is Pentecost. We call now, it wasn't called then, that was Feast of, of the, of the uh, First Fruits. And then uh, the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles would be in the fall. So there were times when they would come and on the journey, they would sing. And they would teach their children what was going on by teaching them these songs. And we all know that if we teach our children songs, that's how they remember things the most. How many started with A, B, C, D, E? It, it really is uh, terribly important to tune our hearts to sing his praise. So 
in my distress. Now, there are a lot of key words that you can see in Markham, but when you're in distress, what do you want? What would you pray for when you're in distress? Deliverance. Deliverance. But what is this psalm saying I need to be delivered from? Lying lips and a deceitful tongue. And then the third and fourth verses sort of flesh out what that means. What shall be given to you, lying lips and and uh, deceitful tongue and what more shall be done to you deceitful tongue you deceitful tongue um a warrior and here's how the deceitful tongue is described in poetry now uh just an aside before i go on hebrew poetry doesn't rhyme it's not meant to be it never will be and some people can't see how to read poetry in the scripture because it doesn't rhyme that's Western thinking, and we got to get rid of that. Remember, we have to go to um, Eastern or Hebrew thinking, and they are expressing emotions just as much as those that rhyme and are melodic, but they, are, they have a different way of doing it. But what is he describing? A deceitful tongue and lying lips? A warrior's sharp arrows with glowing coals of the broom tree. Like shooting these arrows that are flaming. That's a pretty good description of lying lips and deceitful tongue, isn't it? How did James describe it? In, in James 3, the book of James in 3, what did he say about the tongue? Totally deceitful and the source of all the bad stuff. Uh, you, you have to guard your tongue because it is so deceitful. Uh, just read, just mark down if you want James 3, 5 through 8, and you can read what James, because he would recall, he's a Jewish man, he would have grown up with this just like any of the other Jewish boys would have, and he would have understood this uh, psalm in the same way. And then look at this, woe to me, I sojourn in Meshach. Hmm, where's that? That is modern day near Ukraine. The Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. In between, there's that little column or ridge of land, the Caucasus Mountains and so forth, the bottom there. That's Meshach. In between the Caspian and the Black Sea, that land, that's way north. That's way away from home. The picture is I'm way out of my homeland. And Kedar is down in the wilderness of Sinai near on the um, east of Egypt. So it's way away in strange, hostile territory. That's where I am. Too long as I've had my dwelling place among those who hate peace. Wow exactly what's happening today those who hate peace i am for peace but when i speak they are for war so the people around me even though i want peace the people i encounter in the world around me with the lying tongues lying lips and and uh, deceitful tongues they want war that's what I need to be delivered from. The world I'm living in, deliver me from this place. <laughs> I'm leaving this place and moving to Zion and, and traveling to Zion. Okay. This is another familiar Psalm 121. And many people quote, I lift up my eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. That's the King James. Uh, my help comes from the Lord. Well, let's look at this. What does this actually say? Because we need to read it with Hebrew speaking eyes. 
and we don't speak Hebrew. I don't speak Hebrew, but I can look it up because the Lord has provided us an internet that allows us to do that. And you can look it up for yourself as well. You can find out what these words mean so that you can understand the meaning of the thing. Now, I lift up my eyes to the hills means I've got those hills to climb to get to Jerusalem. Everywhere I come from outside of the of environs of Jerusalem, I've got to go up on hills. If you look at the map of Israel, when they, anytime you uh, talk about go, you go up to Israel, uh, up to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem, up to Jerusalem. Carol, Priscilla, did you all go up to Jerusalem? Can you appreciate in your mind how much the distance is that you have to travel up? Because, uh, and it's treacherous. Tr climbing hills is hard work, isn't it? If you're walking, especially with little kids and so forth and carrying on enough to eat and all your stuff that you have, it's hard. I need help to make this journey. I need help to get on this journey. And where am I going to look for help? Now, this word help is that word that means protector or comforter or sustainer. And it is very much related to a keeper, one who keeps me. That's the one who I look to for help, the one who keeps me. And we will see in this Psalm of eight verses, the word keep is used six times. Do you think that's an important concept that he's trying to get across in this Psalm? So I need a keeper. I need someone who protects me, sustains me, comforts me, the things that I need on my journey that is a treacherous climbing journey. My help, the psalmist writes, comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. If he's able to create heaven and earth, do you think he can help me? If I ask him, will he be able to help me? And why would I call on him? Because I know he is able, because I know he is the creator. I know who he is, therefore I can trust him to help me. Do you see how beautiful that is? So I'm not looking to the hills for my help. And I've read that many times in, in commentaries and devotionals and stuff the hill the hills give me no help <laughs> the hills give me trouble climbing they're dangerous and it takes a lot of work to climb hills but i have to climb them to get to where i'm going and i need help to do it where do i call the one who made those hills he ought to be able to help me. And look at, he fleshes out what this help that comes from the Lord looks like. He will not let your foot be moved. Have you climbed the hills that are rocky? And what happens when you step on the stone just wrong? You just slip. He who keeps will not slumber. That means... When I'm in the process of climbing and working and trying to get where I'm going, I don't need my helper to be over there need to take a nap while I'm still working. The whole time he's awake and there. He's not going, he's the one who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. He is always present. Never a time when he's taking a nap and not available for me to call on him. The Lord is your keeper. They sing this to each other, and uh, Warren Wiersbe says, you need to think of this particular song as sung antiphonally. Leanne, what is antiphonal? I thought 
not sure. Oh, I, it's, I'm looking at singers. I think it's when uh, you sing one phrase and another group sings another phrase and you go back and forth and back and forth and tiffin and tiffin singing, I think is what that means. But uh, so it means that you, you say one thing and somebody says something to support what you say and you sing back and forth and that's how you teach each other um, uh, the message of the song. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade on your right hand. The sun will not strike you by day nor the moon by night. Protector. Keeper. Watch over. Preserve. Ah, he will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. You're, you will stay alive as long as you're in his care. There's no evil will befall you. And this is a very colloquial uh, type um, Hebrew saying, but it's all through the um, Old Testament, especially. And the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in. You've seen that in many places, I'm sure. It was from, I. we read it from Abraham. So it's all along. Uh, going out and coming in is a metaphor or a way of saying your daily activities. From the time you get up in the morning till the time you go to bed at night, all the stuff that you're doing, your day, your daily life, it, it, it will keep you during your daily life. From this time and how much longer? How much longer will the Lord keep us? Look at that promise. Isn't that something to praise him for and worship him for? The one who created heaven and earth will keep us forever. Look at that. Isn't that a beautiful? Every time you think of this psalm, where does my help come from? The one who created everything, never sleeps, protects me from all evil and keeps me through everything forevermore. Wonderful Psalm. 122, let, we'll move on. Oh, I, uh, just before I go, our keeper is able in the New Testament, this is how Paul wrote it in Ephesians 3.20. Our keeper, I sort of substituted that for where he he. Um, is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. That's a little bit more modern, but it just says it's a exceedingly abundantly. Above what verse is that, that again? What verse is that again, Terry? Ephesians 3 20. Thanks. And he further, um, I believe it's in Colossians. I didn't write a, the, the, I know whom I believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. That's Paul. I believe it's Colossians, but it could be still Ephesians. I forgot to write down the. But, I mean, we, we've got to see these as precious, precious things that we put in our thinking when we prepare ourselves for worship. Boom. I was glad. Not a term used very often in the Old Testament or in Hebrew, but it's what is glad, do you think? Mm -hmm. 
more than happy. It is happy, but it's more than happy. Right. So glad. It happened like I wanted it to happen and hoped it would happen, <clears throat> but didn't know if it would happen. I'm so glad. I'm so happy. It is a, uh, a sense of of relief, yes, I would agree with that. But it's it's such a powerful word. But it is, I was glad when they said, let us go to the house of the Lord. Now we're approaching Jerusalem. I was so glad when he said, let's go to the house of the Lord. This is a psalm written by David. Not all of them are, but this is one of the ones it is. And our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. This would have been the time after David has established Jerusalem um, as the city of, of David and the city of God. They, they are used in both ways. And then he says, the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem, is a city that is bound firmly together to which the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, as was decreed for Israel to give thanks to the name of the Lord. That is quoted from the Leviticus passage that says three times a year you are to go and worship at the place that I will call for my name. And that's where you're to go for the purpose of thanking and worship. That's way, 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 way back from here. So this is what has been brought and taught and taught and taught from one generation to the next. What does the Lord require? And it is to give thanks to the name of the Lord. What is the name of the Lord? When we say some something's name, anything's name, or a person's name, that's who they are. This is a bottle of cranberry juice. <laughs> that's the name of it. That's who it is. You identify what it is. That's the name. Who is the Lord? That's his name. We, we give thanks for who he is. <clears throat> There in Jerusalem, thrones for judgment were set, the thrones in the house of David. <clears throat> that is his kingdom. That's where the kingdom for Israel was. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Hmm. When Today, now not then, they were not, uh, they wanted Jerusalem to be in peace because often it was fought against all through their history. They would come against the kingdom of Israel, which was the capital was Jerusalem. But today, you hear that phrase, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Okay, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. What happens? What does that mean? When will there be peace in Jerusalem? When Jesus comes. The city of Jerusalem, the physical geographic place in Israel called the city of Jerusalem, that one that's up on the hill. <laughs> when will that happen? Right. When the king of peace, the prince of peace, sits on the throne in the city of Jerusalem. So when you're praying for peace, you are praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you think the Jews are praying for that? No, they have no idea because they don't believe the Messiah has already come, but they are thinking when there is peace in Jerusalem, it will be because the Messiah will come for them. The Messiah will come and establish peace like a warrior, like um, 
defeat all the enemies of Israel. Yes. Okay, so we're told now that we should be praying for Israel and Jerusalem. We can use that as a reference to pray for it now. Wait. Because our, our way of praying for peace for Jerusalem is thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Because we're not praying for a, um, a ruling by force for some warrior to come and defeat all the enemies. That's not the kind of peace we're praying for Jerusalem, for the Prince of Peace to come. So we can pray for the Prince of Peace to come into the hearts of the people that live in Jerusalem. No, we can pray for the Prince of Peace to come because we are to pray, thy kingdom come. But it's got to be bad times before that happens. The tribulation and so forth. What I want you to do is have your eyes open. When, when somebody says pray for the peace of Jerusalem, what does that mean for the believer who knows the scripture? Don't be taken in for today's Western idea of what peace is. Say that again. Oh, of course, peace is, the Prince of Peace is peace with God. It has not, for instance, we could pray for peace in Ukraine. And in our thinking, what would that mean? Stop killing all those people and stop destroying the nation and go away and, and let, you know, let peace reign. No, that is our thinking of peace, but that's not the scriptural meaning of peace. His name, one of his name, wonderful counselor, almighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace, has nothing to do with any militaristic or absence of conflict or any of those things. That's Western thinking. So how do we pray for the peace of Jerusalem now? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Where will his... Where will the Prince of Peace's kingdom be established? In Jerusalem. That's how we pray for the peace of Jerusalem as believers. May they be secure, secure who love you. Peace be within your walls and security within your towers. For my brothers and companions' sake, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. I mean, back when they were praying for the peace of Jerusalem, it was, they were praying for uh, the absence of conflict. Yes. Because they didn't understand until later that a Messiah would be coming who would establish his throne in Jerusalem. That will be after uh, uh, revelation or, or prophecy fulfilled a little after this time. Okay, so 123. Uh, another one of the very very Old Testament ideas and in the Psalms and many or Psalms other than just uh, the Psalms of Ascent are lifting up eyes. Now think about this. There's, it's over and over in these 15, but lifting up your eyes when you pray is quite different than what we do, isn't it? What do we teach our children? Bow your head and be very quiet. That's not what the scripture teaches. Lift up your hands, lift up your eyes toward the throne in the heavens. Why? That's where the one we're praising and praying to is. 
Now, how important is it to make eye contact with someone you're talking to? Do we teach our children that's one of the things you need to learn to do and not be ashamed? You need to look somebody in the eye. Well, when we're praying, ought we not to look somebody in the eye? Lift up your eyes. Behold, the eyes of servants look to the hand of their master. As the eyes of a maidservant to the hands of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God. How? When? Until he has mercy. Now, what is that word mercy used three times in these short verses, four verses? What's mercy? Define mercy. I'm asking for mercy. What am I asking for? Peggy. Yeah, I don't want to get what I do deserve. Please don't give me what I deserve. Have mercy on me. I deserve maybe very significant punishment or judgment or something like that for something that I've done. And I'm lifting my eyes and looking into the eyes of the one who can give me mercy. And I'm asking, please do not give me what I deserve. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us. For we have had more than enough contempt. Mercy because uh, people are treating us terribly. And that was the, true very often for the Jews and it still is. Our soul has had more than enough scorn of those who are at ease and contempt of the proud. Don't give us that thing that we don't deserve. Mercy. That's another, but the, another instruction is that they were that they would teach their children and the generations that would come up is when you pray, you lift your hands and you lift your eyes to the Lord. And they would wear the prayer shawl, which was considered a closet that were closed in, but they were, it was just their eyes and their hands. It wasn't a corporate thing. It was each person looking in prayer. 124 then, uh, another one that is, is expressing gratitude for specific things and gratitude for being blessed. If it hadn't been for the Lord who is on our side, let Israel now say, our side Israel, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side when people rose up against us, then we would have, uh, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away, the torrent would have gone over us, and then over us would have gone the raging waters. That's a picture of being totally destroyed by people who hate you. This can be in any situation you're in where you are surrounded by people who want your you to be dead and not there for whatever reason. And if it hadn't been for the Lord, we'd be dead. Blessed be the, the Lord who has not given us as prey to their teeth. Prey is the poor gazelle at the end of the herd trying to keep up and the lion spot them and hid heads for that one. If it hadn't been for the help of the Lord. And he uses another metaphor, a, a, a bird from the snare of the fowlers, the, the, the one who sets the trap for the bird to catch the bird. The snare is broken and we've escaped. Our help is where? The name of the Lord. Who God is, is our help. Who God is, is our help. Again, who made heaven and earth. 125. 
Here, I want you to go ahead and turn to Hebrews 12 to get ready because we need to talk about this one. Hebrews 12, I, I try to uh, bring forward the New Testament and the more uh, current for us thinking uh, ways of looking at these things as well, uh, because while these are written in the Old Testament by by uh, Old Testament people and living in many thousands of years ago, it's important for us to realize this is all one story, all God's word. And he doesn't speak to one group different than he speaks to another group of his people. So it's just the way it's expressed and how the word is used. Okay. Those who trust in the Lord. Now, isn't that what the Lord has been trying to do since the garden to get us to trust him? And there is a group who trust him. And this group are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved and abides forever. Now, if you are one who has put your trust in the Lord, you can see yourself like Mount Zion, who cannot be moved and abides forever. Well, Mount Zion, Zion was the name was the Canaanite name for the hill that David took and established the city of Jerusalem on. It's a, also called the city of David when he, remember they came up the shaft, we're going to read about it coming up here, comes up the shaft, they climb up and they uh, kill the uh, Jebusites who have control of that mountain at that time. And um, that mountain, there's sort of several peaks of that mountain, but that mountain was called Mount Zion. Okay, what is Hebrew, how, how is Mount Zion described today? Let's look at Hebrews uh, chapter 12. And I'm going to read just a couple of the verses beginning with the first. This is just after discussing all that whole honor roll of the faithful, beginning with Abel. So uh, these are now described as a great cloud of witnesses, those faithful that are, have gone on ahead of us. They're our cloud of witnesses. They're looking down and witnessing. Therefore, since we have such a large crowd of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us is familiar to most of us. Let us run the endurance with endurance the race that lies before us. That's how the pilgrimage or journey is described in the New Testament. A race. Same thing, but it's called a race for us. Things have sort of speeded up since walking from various places up to the, uh, uh, that was maybe a little slower. This is called a race. I, I just love that because so many times in the New Testament, our journey or our walk is called a race. Keeping our eyes on Jesus. Hmm. Lifting our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. And then it describes who he is, who for the joy that lay before him endured the cross and despised the shame and has sat down on the right hand of God's throne. Ought we not then to be lifting up our eyes? Where is the Lord Jesus? Sitting at the right hand of his father in heaven, exalted as the king. Drop down to 1222. There is a lot of discussion between that end of that verse uh, two that I just read. Going through all of the, these verses, let me just scan through them, talking about the race. 
stuff you need to know about the race. So this is a good chapter to study for that regard. And then he comes through, he's described things from the Old Testament and the New. Hebrews is the connection point in many discussions for understanding Old Testament things um, into a New Testament church setting for believers in the New Testament. So let's drop down to 12, verse 22. You haven't been coming to uh, Mount Zion uh, or uh, Mount Sinai, which is described just briefly. Remember when they all gathered around Mount uh, Sinai when the Lord came and the whole top of the mountain was on fire and thunder and lightning and smoke and everything that was terrifying. That's in those verses just ahead, causing them to be terrified and to tremble. Instead, Instead of coming to that experience, verse 22, instead, you have come to Mount Zion. Look at that. Be careful. To the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. Mount Zion for us, when we are putting our trust or like Mount Zion, it's the heavenly Jerusalem. Is it going to move? Is it wishy-washy or can it be defeated? To also, instead, where, where the living God is, to myriads of angels in festive gathering. There is a real festival going on around the throne of God. All these angels worshiping and praising to the assembly of the firstborn. Hmm, who's that? The believers, those who put their trust since the beginning. This would, in, in Hebrews, that began with Abel. Remember who Abel is? Son of Adam and Eve that was killed by his brother Cain, all the way back. Whose names have been written in heaven. Remember the book? Lamb's book? That was written, or the names that were before the foundation of the earth? To God, who is the judge of all, to the spirits of righteous people made perfect, to Jesus, mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood, which says things better things than the blood of Abel, who was the first one to be killed. I'm reading just this brief portion of the passage. I want you to understand when you're reading about Zion, what you're reading about. Now, just this weekend, Pastor Jeff finished up with the uh, end time series that he's been on. What comes down from heaven, the very last thing that is recorded in the book of Revelation? And I saw a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. We just read about it. It's there, and someday it's going to come down. It's there all along. And what are there? The, the folks who've gone ahead of us who have believed, and they're waiting there for us, and someday we'll all have resurrection bodies when he comes there's a lot of prophecy here that they didn't understand until it unfolded those who trust in the lord are like mount zion we know about mount zion now don't we cannot be moved as the mountains surround jerusalem so the lord surrounds his people from this time forth and how long 
Again, he ends that with a piece of beyond Jerusalem. Let's move ahead. 126 is another one. And I, I put on the picture here for you to take a look at because I want you to notice sometimes when translations are done from the Greek or the Hebrew into English, there are some differences. This is one of those differences. This happens to be the um, the uh, English standard. The one that I have on the screen here is English standard. And the one we have in our chronological book is uh, the uh, Holman standard uses the word restore the fortunes of Zion, but in the original Hebrew, that word should be translated captives. And it means that this Psalm, this particular Psalm was probably written when the, um, at least the Northern group of tribes was taken away by the Assyrians. Uh, the captives were there, but it could have also been written after the Babylonian captivity. But it's talking about captives of uh, people who've been taken away from um, Israel as captives. And um, they are praising the Lord for restoring those captives to Zion or Jerusalem. And, and it describes them when, when that happened, it was like it was a dream. It was like, it, this can't be real. This can't be happening. It's a dream. That's what we wanted. But is, is this real? Is it like a dream? Our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with shouts of joy when they said to the nation, the Lord has done great things for them because the surrounding nations saw that these people were taken back. Now they were after the captivity, they were never, there was never a kingdom of Israel anymore, any of those things that were, but they were restored to their land. Restore our captives, O Lord, like streams in the Negev. And then we, there's a song written about this, but this is another uh, familiar portion of this psalm. Those who sow in tears shall reap with shouts of joy. Well, what does that mean? Who sows in tears? When you are in uh, a time of famine or hardship or captivity or so forth, and, and it's a, a lesson for us now, when you're nearly starved and you have grain and so forth that you could grind up and make bread, make flour for bread and so forth, but then you would have nothing to plant for next year. If you eat up everything that you have because you're so hungry and there's so little, there's nothing for next time. You can't, there's nothing to plant with the hope of a harvest, right? So you're giving up hope as, as if there's no future. There's nothing, no reason to not just eat everything I have and lie down and die. <laughs> because that's what happens sometimes with people in that desperate situation. But if you, in tears and trial, hang on to those seeds with faith believing that if you plant them there will be a harvest and I'll eat in the future and my children will eat in the future you plant in in sorrow and tears but you will reap in joy he who goes out weeping bearing the seed for sowing shall come home with shouts of joy, bringing his sheaves with him. That is, when the Lord restores you, you have a future. There's a future for you. There's a future for you. Uh, again, uh, let's move on. Solomon wrote this Psalm 127, and this is most likely um, in response to what his father taught him 
about building the temple. Remember David, his father, uh, had all the materials and had the plans and had everything and he wanted to build it but was told he couldn't. So he would have taught Solomon all about those things. And this is uh, a psalm that Solomon wrote about that. And look at how he is talking about uh, building uh, the temple, which would be the Lord's house. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, work all day struggling and struggling to make, make a living. What does the Lord give when he, he gives his beloved sleep instead of struggling and struggling and struggling? for everything. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward, like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children in one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. We've read that in their songs and, and poems about that even now. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. So what, what is the message that Solomon says? Unless your household, unless your home, unless your country is built by the Lord, it's wasted, it's useless. There, there will be nothing for you. Let's move on to 128. Blessed, and look how many times blessed or blessed is used in these psalms. What is blessing? Blessed of the Lord. When, when the Lord gives a blessing, when do we get blessed? In the Old Testament, what was the promise for getting blessed? Obedience. What's the promise if you don't obey? Judgment or cursing, okay? That's been from the very beginning. Blessing for the obedient, cursing for the disobedient or unbelieving. You know, believers or unbelievers, obedient or not obedient. So blessed is everyone who fears the Lord and who walks in his ways. That's the definition of obedience. Walking in his ways and fearing the Lord. That's obedience. What happens? You shall eat the fruit of the labor of your hands and you shall be blessed in it. You, everything will be well. That's pretty much what Deuteronomy says when Moses said, if you obey, these are the things that you'll get. If you disobey, and that list was way longer, if you'll remember back in Deuteronomy. Your wife will be like a fruitful vine, and that's right out of Deuteronomy. Your children will be like olive shoots around the table. All these little olive shoots around the table. <laughs> Behold, he's, he's saying, pay attention to this. Behold, is pay attention. Thus shall be the man blessed who fears the Lord. You think the message is be obedient? to get, remember you're blessed if you're obedient. The Lord bless you from Zion. May you see the prosperity of Jerusalem all the days of your life. May your uh, children's children, peace be upon Israel. We all want peace, don't we? We all want the absence of this terrible evil and conflict that we see in our war. Not gonna happen until the Lord comes. Uh, before I go, let's see here. What was that number? Oh, I want to go to 129 now. Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth. This is um, uh, David's psalm. This is another psalm of David. And... Uh, 
we we've read uh, just recently in First Samuel for fourteen years, David was on the run from being trying to be killed by Saul. And he, he he was a very young man when he started, and it was just constant. He was running for to stay away from Saul for so long. Greatly have they afflict, afflicted me from my youth. Let Israel now say, Greatly have they afflicted me from my youth, uh, from my youth. Yet they have not prevailed against me. And what he's saying is, Israel was treated the same way I was. Uh, it, the picture is there. The plowers plowed upon my back. They made long furrows. I mean, you can sort of get that picture of uh, being wounded, terribly wounded by, by it. But the Lord is righteous. He has cut the cords of the wicked. May you who hate Zion be put to shame and turned backward. Let them be like the grass on the housetops, which withers before it grows up, which the reaper does not fill in his hand, nor the binder of sheaves of his, um, of sheaves his arms, uh, nor do these who pass by say, the blessing of the Lord be upon you. We bless you in the name of the Lord. We bless you in the name of the Lord. Uh, let's see, 129. What is the name of the Lord? Uh, this is, it, we've spoken about the name of the Lord before, who he is. But when uh, Moses asked him, who's, what shall I tell Pharaoh your name is? I am. Bless you in the I am is how you could read that in Hebrew. Bless you in the I am. That's where our blessings come from. Okay, 130. We might be able to get through some of these here. Out of the depths I cry, O oh Lord. O oh Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. Again, mercy um, is sought. <laughs> Out of the depths. And actually the tense of the verb in Hebrew is I have been crying. It's not I cry to you, but I have been crying. Like it's, I've done this for now for some time hear my voice do you cry out to somebody you don't think will be hearing you or can't hear you you cry out because you know or you trust that he will hear if you O oh lord should mark iniquities O oh lord who could stand remember we talked about mercy Please don't give me what I deserve. If you are marking out my iniquities, there's nobody can stand. Nobody can stand up to this. But with you, there is forgiveness. That is a very rare word in the Old Testament. Forgiveness. It was a concept poorly understood by the uh, Jews. Poorly understood, but the psalmist, and we're not real clear about who wrote this, but the psalmist here is talking about, but with you, there is forgiveness. When you cry out from depths of something and you don't want it to be marked against you, I want mercy. I need mercy. There's forgiveness that you may be feared. If if we believe that the one who, that we call the I am, the Lord, can strike us down dead instantly for whatever we do, that uh, his ability causes us to kind of tremble and be afraid. 
not not fearful so that we think of him as only vindictive and so forth but we have that i don't want to make him mad kind of fear respect respect it's it's even more than respect it's reverence for i don't want to make him mad i but i know he can forgive me if i have sinned so i'm going to cry out for that forgiveness and then what does he say after he's cried out for forgiveness I wait, my soul waits, and in his word, I hope, my soul waits. The Lord, more than a watchman for the morning, if you're like three o'clock in the morning and you're so tired watching and waiting and watching, it's you are waiting for the morning. I want it to come soon, but I'm waiting for what? I've cried out for forgiveness. I'm waiting and waiting like a watchman waits. I, I, in, in his word, I hope, I put my trust. Oh, Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord, what, what are we waiting for? What can we have a, for a promise? For with the Lord, there is what? That steadfast love. That's that word again, translated from his said that we've learned so long ago. His said is that special trait that only God has. It's his special kind of love that is beyond our understanding. It is his grace. It is his long suffering. It is his faithfulness. It is all of those things. But his steadfast love and with him is plentiful redemption, forgiveness. Plentiful redemption. He will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Who? His? Who is Israel? name got changed into Israel after which the whole nation is named Jacob when did his name get changed from Jacob to Israel wrestling man. anybody remember when he was wrestling with the Lord why was he wrestling with the Lord? What was he wrestling the Lord about? Remember, in, and on his way to meet uh, Esau, he was waylaid. He's on his way back from the house of, uh, of uh, Laban, and he's married and has all the children. They're on their way back to Canaan. And on the way, he has a wrestling match with the lord the angel of the lord he was limp from that day on he was struck in the hip he walked with a limp from that day on but what was the what was the wrestling why was he hanging on and wrestling and saying i'm not going to let go until you bless me redeem bless have mercy. I'm not going to let go until I know you're still with me. That's that steadfast love. This is referring to understanding from where these people came, Israel, Jacob, and that, that time. And then there is a prayer. Uh, so that was a prayer of repentance. I put the theme, I sort of tried to make a theme to uh, look at it. But uh, before I go on, 
who 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 is able to forgive us of our sins? Only the Lord. Now we can ask people to forgive us for some wrong we've done and so forth, but can we forgive sins? Anybody, a priest, a preacher? There's only one mediator. There's only one who can forgive sins. Only one. And how is it that he came to be able to forgive us our sins? Hmm? He did die on the cross, but that was, that means until the cross, sin couldn't be forgiven? Huh? He became sin for us. Who loved us so much that he gave his son? God, the three in one, the God, the Father. Only God can forgive. If you have friends who go to confessions and so forth, and uh, ask a priest to forgive them, and they are told to do certain things, and they are forgiven. Does that work? No. Does not. Does not. Only God can forgive. If he is the only one who can forgive, then I should fear him. And we have to be careful with that word because I want him to forgive me, don't I? So I can't come and say, you have to forgive me. I confess, so you have to forgive me. You just tell me something I can do, some money I can pay or whatever, and you have to forgive. No. I have to come in humility and in reverence and ask believing that he can forgive or he has forgiven. And what do we do? Until we are forgiven, wait, wait, wait. Because if we ask for forgiveness and don't wait, are we saying, I told you, you have to forgive me, so do it right now. Forgiveness comes in all sorts of ways, I think, too. Uh, but th that steadfast love, that th that's the thing that allows him to forgive us because of who he is. Because of who he is. 131. Oh, Lord, my heart is not lifted up. Heart. Heart, not eyes. Heart is not lifted up. My eyes are not raised too high. I do not occupy myself with things too great and too marvelous for me. There are some things I just can't get. I just don't, I can't understand it. It's too great and too marvelous for me. It's too amazing. I can't understand it. So I don't spend all my time trying to solve that mystery. How did God do that? I have no idea. And I can't spend all my time trying to figure it out. So I don't have my heart lifted up and my eyes lifted up and occupying myself with that. But I have calmed, I love this thing. This is how, uh, what worship has done 
in my own heart uh, when I've come, because we're coming to the end of the uh, Psalms now. I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. Like a weaned child is my soul within me. Now, a crying baby who is hungry and then taken to his mother's breast and, and fed is one thing of quieting. But when you no longer have to depend on mom to feed you, you can rest that you're able to feed yourself somewhat like a weaned child. I have learned to, to trust that, that I'm going to be provided for. Without my effort, I'm going to be provided for. I think it's just a, a very interesting thing. Weaning occurs when there is no understanding. I, I did some thinking about this weaning process because when you have a baby who is um, bottle dependent or breast dependent or whatever, that baby just cries and you plug him up and he's satisfied, right? Doesn't worry about anything. But what if you? it's not automatic and you have to trust that somebody's going to take care of you? And you're kind of aware that you it's not going to be when you cry every time. But you have weaning means you have to learn to be a little bit on your own and trust. And that's the intention of a mother to wean that child. That's the intention of the mother. You don't want that baby on the bottle for the rest of its life. But that baby has to learn to trust that he will be provided for, right? I think weaning is a metaphor that's used in the Old Testament uh, an awful lot that we need to kind of, but it's part of waiting, learning to wait and being dependent and learning to trust, I think. It allow, uh, being weaned allows me to grow in my faith. If I'm constantly, the bottle is just constantly plugged into my mouth every time I cry, and there's no distance in between and no effort in between, no waiting in between, I, I don't grow. I stay a baby. Interesting concept. 32, 132 is the longest of them. And this is uh, written about David, but it is probably not written by David himself. This might have been written by Ezra. It's, it's, uh, Ezra was a priest that was uh, in the captivity, Babylonian captivity, and came back with the captivity afterwards. So it would be many hundreds of years from uh, when David was. But remember, O oh Lord, in David's favor, all the hardships he endured and how he swore to the Lord and vowed to the mighty one of Jacob. And, and this is sort of a retelling of what David went through when he, he said he, he was praying at the uh, site where he had put the Ark of the Covenant, made it a place for it to rest, and uh, he would come and, um, and pray constantly, uh, often. Uh, when he was living, he had, had he built his palace, and he was saying, wait a second, I'm living in this cedar palace, and the Ark of the Lord is in a little tent over there? This is not right. 
I am not going to rest until I build a house for the Lord. And that's how it started. And this is re recalling um, uh, that history uh, that was told to Israel. I will not enter my house or get into my bed. I will not give sleep to my eyes or slumber to my eyelids. Isn't that a poetic way of saying I won't? stop and rest until I find a place for the Lord, a dwelling place for the mighty one of Jacob. So he say, I, I, I want to build something. Now he was told later he can't do it. And his son would do it. But behold, we heard it in Ephrata. We found it in the fields of Jar. Let us go to his dwelling place. Let us worship at his footstool. Arise, O Lord, and go to your resting place, you and the ark of your might. Let your priests be clothed with righteousness and let your saints shout for joy for the sake of your servant, David. Do not turn away the face of your anointed one. And because of that couple of verses there, it is felt that this was probably written by Aesop who was one of the uh, songwriters that David employed to write songs to be sung in the temple. And so it, it, it's sort of like a history uh, portion and to, for them to recall. And then he, uh, the psalmist writes, uh, the Lord swore to David a sure oath. And this is um, uh, the promise that was made to David when uh, the Lord made the covenant with David that someday on his throne would be a forever king. Somebody would sit on his throne forever. And that was where the whole idea of a coming Messiah who would be the king of Israel um, began. That, that um covenant made with David. We'll come to that pretty soon. He said, one of the sons of your body, I will set on your throne. That was a Davidic covenant that is made. It's in 2 Samuel 7, if you want to read that history. If your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies then, that I shall teach them, their sons also forever shall sit on your throne, meaning there will be a dynasty for David. That lasted until Nebuchadnezzar took down the kingdom because they had a king who refused to worship God. So, if they keep my covenant and my testimonies, they'll sit on the throne. Well, there came a time when they broke the covenant and he took them off the throne. There's been no king since then of Israel. For the Lord has chosen Zion. He has desired it for his dwelling place. That's where we get the idea from, uh, from that psalm and others that Jerusalem was the place that the Lord picked for them to bring the Ark of the Covenant for him to dwell in that place. This is my resting place. How long? Hmm. Right now, it's the Jerusalem that's in heaven, <laughs> which will come down. It's not the Jerusalem which is presently on earth, but it is my the, the Zion. When we, we read that in uh, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, we understand that from there. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. I will abundantly bless her provisions. I will satisfy her poor with bread. This is for Jerusalem. Her priest I will clothe with salvation, and her saints will shout with joy. And then we have a little prophecy here. There I will make a horn to sprout for David an authority to sprout in the throne of David. I have prepared a lamp for my anointed. 
prophetic language. His enemies I will clothe with shame, but on him his crown will shine. Remember, these are hymns sung, hymns sung for, uh, to teach history, to teach theology, to teach doctrine to each other and to the next generations coming up in a way to make them aware of who it is they're, we're worshiping and why we worship him. So this was all part of the uh, plan to uh, be part of that. The Lord will see to it that Jerusalem has a king someday because it's a forever promise that he gave. It will be restored. Actually, when Zechariah was giving his praise about uh, his son, John, who was later called the Baptist, <laughs> Zechariah and his son, John, said uh, that he is going to precede the one who's coming. And he says in verse 69 of Luke 1, 69, that real long chapter where you have the whole picture that we have of John and his father, Jesus is the promised son of David. That was saying this prophecy has been fulfilled. This prophecy has been fulfilled. The throne the seat of power in, in Jerusalem, the temple, the city itself were all destroyed by the Babylonians in 586 BC, of course. The temple was rebuilt by the monarchy and, but was never reestablished as um, a, a, a kingdom ever. They rebuilt the temple, but they never could reestablish it as a kingdom ever again since then and the song expresses the longing for that kingdom to come to be fulfilled there was sort of built into this psalm a gap can you sort of see this gap between I will make a horn. There's a, you're, there's a thing that's going to come in the future. And there seems to be a gap between what's now that they're talking about and what they expect to be in the future. When we have a promise and then there's a gap for the fulfillment, what are we to exercise uh, in ourselves between looking at the promise and waiting for it to be fulfilled. Faith. Faith is how we fill that gap. Israel had to do that too. And they kept looking for a Messiah. Obviously, they're in their blindness still looking for a Messiah. But uh, a Messiah was promised and they had to wait for it. And they had to look for it. And that's faith. Requires faith to do that. Okay, there's this another one, which I think is a, a really important of the, uh, the ones for teaching um, each other and the generations that come. 133, behold how good and pleasant. Now in Hebrew, that word good, it has a special meaning. And it comes in the very first chapter of Genesis. When God did something and he said, he said, it is good. What did, does anybody remember the definition of what God means when he says it was good? Works as it was, huh? functions as it was. Very good, Debbie. It is Functioning as designed. It's working like it's supposed to. It is behaving like it's supposed to. How good and pleasant, 
the way you're supposed to function when you dwell in unity. And that word can also be translated harmony. Because unity doesn't mean everybody's exactly the same, like cookie cutter, but it does mean a group working together in harmony and not dissonance. So how does God want his people to function as design in unity? Paul spent a lot of ink, so to speak, in the New Testament talking about how important unity is in the church. And the basis of unity in the church. What is this unity? It is like precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron running down on the collar of his robes. That's that precious oil, which is the anointing oil that has that special recipe that is written in Exodus about the anointing oil for the priest or the king that has been chosen by God for a specific function. Only for that reason would that anointing oil, but when they poured it over the head, it would run literally, it, said, it describes it uh, about Aaron when he was consecrated with the anointing oil it ran down his on his uh on his head down on his beard and onto his collar meaning you don't just put a couple of drops <laughs> you pour this precious oil that's how unity you pour it over so that it is abundant and comes all the way down onto your collar the holy spirit well, no, unity is uh, what people do. But the oil is the type. Of not, that oil is anointing oil. It's not the same as the Holy Spirit. The anointing oil is what a person uses to what in that time was used. It did not mean the Holy Spirit because it was a person doing this to a person. And the Holy Spirit is not poured over a person by a person it's a little bit different not every single time you read oil is does it mean the holy spirit sometimes it does but would that mean to when he was anointed with oil did that mean he was set apart he was set apart yeah. by god because he was chosen by god but a person anointed him as a public display, this is the one that was chosen. This is the king that I chose for oil over his head. Okay. Here's another description. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. Well, let's talk about Hermon for a minute. Anybody know about Hermon? Did you, did you guys go up to, um, when you were in Israel, go up by Mount Hermon? It is the tallest mountain in the geographical location of Israel. It makes what are called the Golan Heights. Very top, right by um, sort of near Lebanon and right part of Syria says it's ours, but Israel says it's ours. It's been Israel since Mount Hermon has snow most of the year around, unusual in that area, but and that snow melts and runs down and forms the headwaters of the River Jordan the only river of its magnet, it's the, the source of water for Israel. So that's the picture. It is the source of life-giving water. Unity is like precious oil or life-giving water. Kind of, remember this is poetry, talking in poetry about things and describing things. So is unity really important to the Lord? 
and expected, like if we're to function as designed, we are to be in unity. His people are to be in unity. And it is a beautiful thing and a life-giving thing when we are unified for there in unity, the Lord has commanded the blessing. In other words, we must be obedient in unity. We, we must be, uh, uh, unity is required to be obedient and to be blessed. It is life forevermore. I think Paul was reading this very one when he talked to the uh, to the New Testament church in two or three of his letters talking about unity and the need for staying unified. Do not be fussing amongst yourselves. Don't go, don't sabotage each other. Don't undo the work of each other and, and do the work together as a team kind of thing. Unity is extremely important in the body of Christ, the body of the Lord. But uh, Mount Hermon is a one unique thing in Israel. It is the headwaters or source of the life-giving water for a very dry, arid nation that they required for their livelihood. The last of the Psalms then that are sung in, in unity is really a benediction. It is going away like the first one was the coming to, this is a final benediction and a going away uh, from the worship and the praise and the festival. And here you, um, the benediction is blessing God and blessing each other. There are songs we have today of uh, blessing or asking each other to bless each other. Come bless the Lord, all you. How many, what are, what are we called now? After we're servants who stand by night in the house of the Lord, lift up your hands to the holy place and bless the Lord. May the Lord bless you from Zion, he who made heaven and earth. How many times has it been described as he who made heaven and earth in just these Psalms? That's who God is. That's who God is. Praise him for his blessing. I, I kind of was trying to think of a uh, song of ascent or preparation for worship, maybe that was a little bit more modern, although this isn't so modern. So I came up with this one. I'm going to play a little bit. This is a um, mission school in South Africa that is singing this. And I'm going to go ahead and play it. I think it, you should be able to hear it online as well. From children to adults, every is a Thank you. 
Okay. Isn't that, isn't that the kind of thing we need to do to prepare our hearts? And this is this was made just a few years ago, but this is um, a, a mission school in the heart of Johannesburg. And I had some others. I have a couple of others who, uh, uh, let's see, let me. I mean, what's that? I found one from the box. Yeah. There's one from Nairobi I have um, as well. Um, there, there are people, the people, the, the ones who love the Lord are singing his praises and worship and preparing their hearts for worship all over this world. And we need to be part of that. We should not be casual about gathering together and, um, and worshiping. It is not a casual thing. I believe that the Lord included this hymn book, Songs of Ascent, on purpose in this compilation of all the psalms. And there were many psalms that were never kept or recorded that are in Hebrew literature. So these were the ones that were picked and chosen. We need to read the Psalms, as I keep saying, for all they're worth. There's an awful lot there to learn about who the Lord is from his Psalms. So uh, I'm going to stop recording.